This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, good morning and welcome to all of you. My name is Jim Wagner and serving as president of Emory University, I have the privilege and terrific, great delight of welcoming back to Atlanta His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Agreed. In 2007, we at Emory were deeply humbled and indeed blessed when His Holiness accepted our invitation to join the Emory faculty as a presidential distinguished professor. Now, it may interest you to know that His Holiness does not request nor accept any payment for his participation and participation in this, this event and those planned for his visits here in Emory and Atlanta. All ticket proceeds are used to cover the costs of producing the programs on Emory and also the ones on Emory's campus. And any funds left over, along with the generous donations from our sponsors, go directly to support the Emory Tibet Partnership and the Emory Tibet Science Initiative. And you can read about those in your programs. We are grateful for His Holiness's presence, but interestingly, you may know he personally has supported these initiatives as well. So it is in his capacity of professor that he returns this week, as he did initially in 2007, and when he returned again in 2010, his holiness will challenge our hearts and also our minds. And in particular on this visit, he will ask us to think about the ethical dimensions of our lives in an often fractured and hurried and confused modern world. Since the publication of his book, Ethics in the New Millennium, more than a decade ago, he has continued to explore the common values of humanity and to search for the language that can help us to transcend our differences. Most recently in his book, Beyond Religion, that, uh, in that book he has revitalized our thinking about the possibility of a universal ethics. Now it makes sense for Emory to host these conversations. Beginning with its founding by the Methodist Church in 1836, a partnership that continues to this day, Emory has always been about preparing more than just job-ready graduates. Emory graduates are indeed highly employable, but Emory faculty in all nine of our schools and colleges, by their example and effectiveness through teaching, research, and scholarship, and healing, are committed also to preparing life-ready citizens to go out and not only to do well, but to do good. In the 1980s, then-President Jim Laney stressed openly the need to educate the heart as well as the mind. And Emory's vision statement since 2003 has been explicit about our aspiration to work toward an ethically engaged community. Our Office of Religious Life has fostered a tradition of deep interreligious dialogue on campus among Christians and Jews and Hindus, Muslims and Buddhists. Indeed, if you attend an Emory commencement, or an opening convocation, you would receive blessings from all of those faith traditions. And finally, Emory's Center for Ethics has been what you might call an in-your-face presence on our campus, calling us to find ethical lessons and challenges in everything from political discourse and medical policy to art and film and music. In fact, we are pleased today to call upon our director of the Center for Ethics at Emory, Dr. Paul Root Wolpe, to introduce and to guide this morning's session. Now, in addition to directing the Center for Ethics, Dr. Wolpe is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Bioethics and the Raymond F. Shinazi Distinguished Research Chair in Jewish Bioethics. Among many professional affiliations and activities, Dr. Wolpe serves as the first senior bioethicist for NASA and was the first national bioethics advisor to Planned Parenthood Federation of America, 
is the past president also of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. Dr. Wolpe's work focuses on social, religious, ethical, and ideological impact of technology on the human condition. His teaching and publications range across many fields from death and dying to genetics and eugenics, and from sexuality and gender to mental health and illness. Dr. Wolpe has been chosen, in fact, by the teaching company, and many of you, I suspect, are customers, but he's been chosen by the teaching company as, and I quote, a superstar teacher of America. And he has also won the World Technology Network Award for Ethics to lead, help lead our conversation this morning. Please welcome Dr. Paul Root Wolpe. Well, thank you so much, President Wagner. Uh, thank all of you for coming here today and spending time with His Holiness, and I hope that uh, the conversation we have is one that expresses questions that are in your mind as well. I have spent my life at universities, and universities believe in the importance of knowledge. We create new scholarship. We teach the findings of generations of scholars who came before us. We are the keepers of centuries of human inquiry. It's a noble mission. Yet each of us now holds in our hand and on our desktop access to literally billions of pages of information. A smart 10-year-old can, in a moment, find facts that would have taken hours of searching in a library just a few short years ago. We're a society that seems inundated with access to information. So with the accumulated knowledge of the human species at our fingertips at every moment, why don't we feel more enlightened? Why haven't we solved some of our most difficult problems? We seem a lot better informed but not much smarter. What's missing? What is missing, I believe, is wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge leavened by experience and by emotional insight. Wisdom is a deep understanding that appreciates uncertainty, that uses mature judgment, that is steeped in compassion. Wisdom is much harder to find with our search engines it resides in our major religious traditions, in the debates of our great thinkers, in the profound observances of the wise men and women of every generation. The human family has no greater treasure than the truly wise among us. That's why we are here this morning. It is a rare privilege to be in the presence of a human being who not only embodies the wisdom of his tradition, but has the gift of being able to present it to us with humility, humor, and great humanity. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Sorry. Uh <laughs> Actually, I always act like, act completely, <laughs> completely informal. Informal way. Informal way. So then I met, I saw, this is my longtime friend. And I always call him as a, as my hero. Uh, so, in my, in my sort of feeling, I cannot sort of remain here. I'll just see. I greet him. Greet him. Greet him. And those people, among my friends, there are a uh, number of people who cannot see eyes, but cannot see. So we have some method. I usually should take my glass and then let them to touch my face. <laughs> that they, because their hands are very, very sharp, 
shall feed you. So they notice this is the same person. So you mentioned it's the same nose. <laughs> <laughs> so this really shows uh, age about 10. Suddenly, not sort of much experience of religious practice. Uh, simply young boy after hitting and instantly his eyesight lost. But he not develop anger. Uh, so human being, as a human being, biologically we have that kind of ability, capacity. that capacity. Actually, I think that's the basis of, of secular ethics. Secular ethics is a much different with biological factor. <laughs> so then, since we know very close each other, so I often teasing him. So because of his peace of mind, eventually, I mean, he carry his study continuously. Then eventually he found a very beautiful girl <laughs> and married and two beautiful girl, two daughters, daughters, two daughters. So I often, you see, teasing him. He cannot enjoy the beautiful <laughs> face. He cannot see the beautiful faces of wife and two daughters. I can see. <laughs> 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 so, oh. so thank you. I really uh, feel great honor. Now, secular ethics. I think firstly we have to look uh, humanity and human history, particularly recent history. The 20th century, I usually describe my century. Uh, those people whose age now above 50, 60, and these people belongs to 20th century. And then those people uh, whose age uh, below 15, 20, even 30, I think that generation is in bronze to 21st century. So firstly, I would like to know, you see, those, uh, those young people whose age uh, below 15, raise hand. Uh, 15, 15, 15. Oh, yes, one, one uh, girl, what is it? Oh, yeah, 15. Huh? Then, below 20, uh, below 30, uh, then perhaps below 40. I think those, be those people those whose age 40, then I think between there, half is bronze 20th century. <laughs> Half bronze to the first century. <laughs> so now think myself, uh, 1935, I born. Uh, I born. Uh, already Second World War crisis already building up. And then this Sino-Japanese sort of conflict also, you say, more or less, I think, start. Then the uh, Second World War, really immense sort of violence, suffering. I think you American escaped, <laughs> but rest of the Europe I think immense destruction. 
immediately after the war, I think people there are really passing through hardship. Uh, and as well as Japan. J Japanese case, even two uh, atom bombs actually drop on them. I personally you see, met, I think my first or second visit to Japan, Hiroshima, I actually met uh, some old lady who are victims of nuclear bomb. And really terrible, very sad. And then, after Second World War, Korean War, number of people killed, suffered. And then Vietnam War. I feel the beginning of 21st century, some violence, even today, like Syria. Really, very, very sort of sad. Innocent people, children, really suffer. These, I believe, the symptom of the past mistake and past sort of negligence. So, in the 20th century, some historians say over 200 million people killed in that century through violence. Uh, and then, I think. They, this, I think, thousand year old, so some kind of sort of concept, we human being. You see, they, uh, in order to win yourself, force is the key element. So then, the new finding technology, uh, you see, helping to increase immensely a destructive power. So then, you see, uh, so time passes, that old concept then become more dangerous. So, uh, I think actually the immense sort of violence really brought new world, new shape of world. Then we can say or that although immense suffering, but produce some good result. That's not the case. Contrary, as I mentioned earlier, because of that kind of sort of way of thinking. Force is the key element to win uh, over so-called your enemy. So even today, sometimes even religion also used for that. Religious faith also is used for that. So, so now, 20th century, wonderful century. A lot of sort of innovation there, uh, finding new, many useful, use, many useful things and develop. However, that surgery really uh, remain, become like, I think, center of violence, center of bloodshed. So now, we have to think, our uh, existing way of thinking, ultimately very much based on uh, extreme self-centered attitude, individual level, national level. So that's the key element to divide we and they. That's the basis of violence. If you keep others 
also part of humanity. Also brothers, human brothers, sisters. Oneness of seven billion human beings. Then, no room. Killing other. Bully other. Cheating other. They're also the same human brothers, sisters. So I feel, I, not only my, myself, but many my friend, you see, now feels the only way to solve this problem uh, through dialogue, through talk. I think we already witnessed uh, some problem. Previously, the source of violence, but through, through talk, through dialogue, can solve. So they are, the dialogue means respect other, respect their interest. And through that way, the less of the concept of we and they, they also part of humanity. We must respect them. We must take seriously about their own interest. That's the, uh, uh, so this, the basis of meaningful dialogue. So now, 20th century becomes century of bloodshed, century of violence. Now, this century should not follow that way. I think within 20th century, I think actually, uh, nuclear sort of threat after Berlin Wall disappear, uh, East Bloc, West Bloc, military, military sort of blocks should disappear, I think much reduce. So these take place within the same century, not by force, but by, I think, awareness, not the government level but people's level. Uh, so there is hopeful sign. We human beings becoming more mature. Through immense suffering, immense of problem. So now, 21st century is continuation of that century. Uh, there is possibility to create peaceful century in order to uh, achieve, in order to create a peaceful century. Uh, the source of problem, source of conflict always there. Now, the, realistically, the proper way is whenever we face problem, the potential of conflict, and with respect to their right, their view, and talk. That's the dialogue. So, in order to create peaceful century, we must develop strong belief. Any problem must solve through talk, through dialogue. So, this century should be a century of dialogue. Now, in order to develop, you see, uh, in order to create a sense of dialogue, we need, I think, uh, we, we should sort of reduce the extreme self-centered attitude. So the only thing is, uh, more sort of respect others. How to develop respect? If you develop a sense of concern of their well-being as a human brother, sisters, then, then respect automatically come. Genuine love, not so sense of pityness, pity, look down, no, respect them. So. The, as in order to build a peaceful century, we should 
uh, that, that automatically become center of peace, center of nonviolence. This ultimately is related with compassion, sense of concern of others' well being. So we must make every effort to build this century uh, center of compassion. I think that's very, very important. Now, when I use the word compassion, uh, you see, there are two levels of compassion, or sense of concern of others' well being. One compassion, mainly biological factor. As I already mentioned, uh, should move as an example. We are already equipped because we come from our mother. Sometimes I sort of uh, jokingly telling people some sort of ancient sort of stories. Stories of the Legends. Ancient legends. 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 Of, legends. You see, some great sort of say, the, hmm, spiritual leaders come from lotus. So then, then sometimes I, say, I mean, with respect, a uh, little bit sort of, I mean, jokingly, I'm telling uh, such wonderful sort of spiritual leaders may have more compassion towards a lotus rather than a human being. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, we not come from lotus, but come from our mother. Uh, so therefore, uh, so logically, the way we grown up, uh, at very young age, early age, we individually see, cannot, uh, cannot sort of look after oneself like some other animal. No. Our survival entirely depends on someone else's care. Uh, okay. So, immense sort of the effort caring you, you need sort of strong sort of emotion strong feeling, that's love, compassion. So, person who received sort of maximum affection from other, they already seeding, right? seedling. Planted the seed. Uh, planted seed of compassion. So I often say telling people, those individuals, I think here, uh, outwardly, everybody very smart. <laughs> but deep inside, those individuals who received maximum affection from our mother, from our parent, and our friends, I think these people, in deep inside, much happier. Those individuals who received less of affection or parent abandoned, sometimes abuse, those such sort of experienced people, outwardly very successful in material fields and these things, but in deep inside, sense of insecurity. That automatically develops a sense of fear sense of distress. Always remain a little bit distant from other. So we are social animals. The very basis of our future, our happy life, depend on the community. So the person who develop some kind of sense of fear from others, sense of distress. How can that person be a happy person? So these are biological factors. However, that biological factor, compassion, affection, is, uh, is very much oriented about others' attitude. Now we need that compassion take as a seed, 
then use our knowledge, our special human brain. And other animals have not, not that kind of ability. Yes. Hmm? Now use our intelligence, awareness. And then, you see, that sort of potential of sense of concern of others' well-being, then further sort of, because of that, extend. Not oriented about others' attitude, but being a human case, human being uh, itself. Not, not their attitude, not their So that we can do. So you see, develop sense of oneness of humanity. And particularly today, uh, the ecology problem, and also global economy, and technology also, you see, uh, as the other person you see mentioned, you mentioned, you see, now technology, these are the, because of the instrument, small, small sort of instrument, really, you see, bring closer together. together. And then on top of that, the West need East or Middle East. Or North need South, South need West, because of North. That's the reality. So the, actually the reality, unlike ancient time, ancient time, country to country, more or less independent, so concept of destruction of your neighbor is victory of yourself. That's the same meaning. Now today, everything interdependent. So concept of, very concept of uh, uh, the, the enemy defeat or destroy is victory of yourself. It's completely now not reality. So destruction of your neighbor is destruction of yourself. Because heavily interdependent, that's, an, that's an now a new reality. So now we have to think how to build this more compassionate society. If we try to build compassion, uh, relying on true religious faith, yes. All major religious traditions. Wonderful. Uh, over, I think, at least 2,000, 3,000 years, those religious traditions, major religious traditions, really provide humanity inner peace through compassion. Wonderful. But the reality, now not adequate. Firstly, I saw uh, one sort of report. Out of seven billion human beings, over one billion human beings, uh, they formally express they are non believer So over one billion, uh, quite a substantial number, quite a big portion of humanity. Then, frankly speaking, uh, even those around six billion human beings who are supposed to believe, but among believers, uh, any, any spiritual tradition, there are a lot of corruptions. <laughs> I think including uh, Tibetan Buddhist community. Oh, hopefully, I'm not corrupted, I think, <laughs> because I always criticize others. So, Oh, I have to sort of think seriously about corruption. <laughs> so you see, uh, with big name, you see, oh, easily corrupt. There's danger. Uh, and particularly, you see, the, those people who, I mean, what we call devoted people, oh, devotees, you can exploit them easily, manipulate their faith. So, all these sort of religious believers, they officially believe, but in reality, not much serious. <laughs> so these mm, uh, lacking their basic faith 
or belief or conviction. Moral principles are really the most important sort of the factor for a happy life, for a happy humanity. So since those is religious sort of tradition, of course, wonderful. I'm Buddhist. Buddhist teaching, wonderful. But not adequate, no matter oh, one religion, marvelous religion, but never be universal. That's clear. So now this problem is universally we are facing this problem. Now we have to find ways and means to cover entire 7 billion human beings. And not only that, religion you see, sometimes, you see, use more faith. Uh, so faith, I myself also, you see, I'm Buddhist. It's a certain point which very much based on faith. And sometimes I also, you see, a little bit sort of skeptical. <laughs> uh, so those point which two reasoning point out then these are very much sort of convincing. So therefore, the way promotion of compassion, not based on faith, but used through reasons. Now here, I usually is called, I usually is mentioned from our common experience, as I mentioned before, uh, we all already sort of equipped the very seed of love, compassion. Then use common sense. Look your, at your neighbor, those of the family. Uh, economically, may not be very sort of rich or very successful, but within the family, everybody loves full trust each other. So that family, even some outsider enter that family, immediately you feel uh, warm, full of friendship, full of sort of friendly sort of atmosphere. Uh, your meal may not be very expensive, but you can you can join, enjoy it. Right? Enjoy me with full of friendship, trust. Whereas another sort of family, very rich, when you enter in that family, looks, you see, all the facility building very big, the, in, the, in, the, in the inside, all furniture, these things are very expensive and they're very, very nice. Uh, uh, I think outside a very good car and inside a very good television for all these things there. But if that family, even member, also among the member of the family, some kind of jealousy, some kind of distrust, husband a little bit distrust, wife, wife, a lot of sort of city, ornament. But a little bit of distrust, <laughs> husband. <laughs> then, I think uh, that home never be very happy human home. Plenty of money, plenty of wealth. A very essential thing of human being is friendship. Friendship entirely depends on trust. Trust based on respect, honest, uh, so sense of concern of others will be. When, when that is lacking, the material value will not bring real human happy happiness. So use our common sense. Then most important, our scientific sort of researcher sort of finding. Some scientists, uh, uh, actually, you see, mentioned 
the constant fear, constant anger, hatred, actually eating our immune system. Then, also you see now, nowadays, you see, we use the word in order to build healthy body, we must uh, pay more attention about healthy mind, healthy mind, healthy body. Uh, then also now these days, uh, you see, we used with the, how's the word hygiene of physical well-being. Similarly, we need hygiene of mental well-being. So mental experience are more effective than physical experience. Some pains, physical level, can subdue by mental sort of thing, thinking, uh, mental thinking. The mental level, pains and worry cannot subdue by physical comfort. So mental level is more serious, more important. So our very existing education system, oriented about material value. So frankly speaking, this is not adequate. When healthy mind is concerned, we usually are relying on religious faith. Very good, but not efficient, not sufficient. Really. Not sufficient, uh, and will not be universal. So therefore, now, on the basis of biological factor, uh, use our intelligence through education, we can bring firm conviction in the people's mind for, for their own happy future, healthy body, warm-heartedness, sense of concern of others' well-being. Is really very, very essential. Once through education, through awareness, uh, develop firm conviction, then I think, uh, uh, firstly, one individual, whether believer or non-believer, irrespective, uh, through education, we can develop firm conviction in this. In, in, the, in the mind. So then, uh, the try uh, also they the change humanity, not through United Nations or through government. I think United States through Capitol Hill right? or through White House. I don't think you see change <laughs> the people's of because of that mm -hmm. con conviction on these things. So. So, the humanity means combination of seven billion human beings. So, human, any human society means combination of individual. So, change must start from individual. So, now here, few thousand, I think, people here, each individual have the potential to build, uh, firstly, yourself, happy person. No matter what sort of situation, you can keep peace of mind. Once one individual, uh, through, through awareness, you see, develops some kind of capacity uh, to keep peace of mind, no matter what the circumstances and difficulties, uh, then your family, can build that way. Then one family then share your uh, your sort of city neighbors, uh, not through prayer but talk, change experiences, talk. Uh, then ten family can multiply hundred family, thousand family, hundred thousand family. That's the way change. Of course, I'm not expecting the sort of better sort of world achieved within my lifetime. 
I think I may remain another uh, 20 years or 25 years. Then I will no longer there. Uh, so this is not my my personal my, my own case. This case, I think there are quite a number of people ready to go together. <laughs> <laughs> See, the uh, 20th century we already say goodbye. <laughs> so now I think <laughs> the so middle way, 21st yeah. century is so, so that, I mean, say 21st century, say uh, 2000. Uh, 30, 2040, 2050. I think most of my brothers, sis, elder brothers, sisters. I think, I think we, we will leave from this planet. So all this trouble remain on those 21st century people's <laughs> shoulder. So now, the generation of 21st century must think very seriously about that. I think it is not sufficient just to complain when we heard Syria and so problem, Iraq, many, many other problems, and, and Africa, a lot of problems. And also in many different parts of the, the world. And also you see gap, rich and poor, corruptions. These are universal problems. It is not sufficient just to complain. We have this sort of intelligence. Try to find what is the way to solve this problem. I think we have the ability. So therefore, now please think, should not think our sort of existing way of thinking, way of life is something perfect. Should not think that way. Think more seriously. Seeing these lot of sort of drawbacks, a lot of sort of unhappy event. Now, most of these events, human own creation. So logically, you know, nature disaster, these are beyond our control. Perhaps if some sort of help, then pray to God. Maybe God do something, I don't know. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think actually, I think, I believe action is more important than faith, than prayer. So, in order to carry effective action, meaningful action, we need vision. We need enthusiasm. All this, not from money, will not come from money, but from mind, awareness. So, human, awareness, human sort of intelligence and the human sort of potential of warm-heartedness combine these two things. I think, I'm quite sure, a lot of man-made problem can reduce, if not sort of eliminate. That's quite sure. Therefore, now secular ethics, without touching, without relying on religion, simply use common experience, and common sense, and scientific findings. That also, not through preaching, but through education, from kindergarten up to university level. I think. Then, within this century, I think the world can be more compassionate century. That I think, uh, I think, are possible. So that I would like to, to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for those words and uh, the sentiments that you've given us today. I want to start with a strange question. You walked down and you met a friend of yours and you called him your hero. Yes. What is a hero? Hero of compassion, hero of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. See, he, as I mentioned there, see, I always say, use my sort of tongue, talk, 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 blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he actually implemented that. And also, at a young age, no special sort of or sort of, no sort of serious religious sort of study or religious practice, but instinctly, as a human human boy. Huh? Let me get that out of the way, so people can see you. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> good. Thank you, thank you. So, so I, I think quite rare, such such sort of uh, 
such, in, such, 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 such case. So therefore, uh, uh, I use uh, him as my hero. Hmm. Like that. I, I'm trying to understand what makes a hero. Is it someone who overcomes an obstacle? Is it someone who takes action? Is it someone who shows inner strength? What makes someone a hero? Not a hero, you see. The, under difficult circumstances, he kept, uh, he, has a, he, has a, uh, he never sort of say, let develop anger, hatred. I think if, you see, his sort of, uh, the, the sort of the, uh, experience, if it happened to me, I think I may cry, cry, <laughs> complain, and express <laughs> anger, I think. Uh, uh, so therefore, I really appreciate, you see, he, uh, also he not dull, <laughs> if some, someone dull, well, dull, then maybe, you see, without much feeling, <laughs> <laughs> Such things may happen, but he, you see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you see, the, after that instance, you see, he carried his study and eventually built a very happy family. So, a very normal human being, but at the same time, you see, such a immense difficult, you see, a lost eyesight, I think. Uh, my my eye also you see some cataracts. 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 Sometimes I, uh, some <laughs> English words I difficult to pronounce. So, <laughs> mm. so, uh, so you see, that, that illness you see happened. So then, uh, uh, reading is one day a little bit sort of difficult. One day a little bit sort of easier. So finally, I went for the surgery. Surgery. Mm. So even a little bit sort of difficult to read, feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so then completely lost the eyesight. Very, really terrible. So there's a sufficient reasons, feel frustration, anger. That also is not Kasoda, uh, Kasoda, natural surgery. So that was also not something happened naturally, but it was caused by someone else accidentally oh, or being shot. Shot. So like that. So I call hero. So you talked about the 20th century and the 21st yeah. century. We all know the challenges that the 20th century faced with world wars, um, with economic depressions. What do you think are the great challenges of the 21st century? I think, as I already mentioned, I think education is key factor to create new way of thinking, eventually new way of life. So the education itself, not much sort of talk about this inner value. That's, I think, real challenge. Mm -hmm. We have to sort of uh, discuss, think, uh, and try to find out the complete sort of, because of the complete form. Uh, right. To make it complete. Uh, education built for healthy body. Equally, education, through education, must how to build healthy mind. So that I think, I, I think, for the time being, I think that's one sort of challenge, serious challenge. And then, according to some sort of uh, information, the, uh, the, the end of this century, human population will reach 10 billions. So then, the nature resources, and all these, also, I think, a lot of new problems. And then, the global warming already creates some problems, nature disasters. This definitely will increase. So this, uh, 
I think, concern of these 21st century generation. <laughs> so you should, you should prepare how to face these problems. <laughs> so these, uh, uh, some cases beyond our control. In some extent, you say our sort of our way of life and existing sort of economy system. Look, you see, usually see people say more cars, so that's an indication of more sort of de economic development. More economic development. But then eventually, 10 billion human beings, 10 billion cars, impossible. Uh, I always telling, uh, the India's. I see the economy, existing sort of economy system may not be sustainable. So global level also, you see, we have to think American lifestyle, I think uh, not necessarily sustainable. I think we have to think, you see, these, uh, these, uh, uh, these also see kind of challenge. challenge. We have to so sort of think very seriously. In, in your secular ethics, you base that on an idea of compassion. It is easy to have compassion for the person you're talking to. It's easy to have compassion for your family and the people around you. What studies in ethics show is that the further you get away from an individual, the more difficulty people seem to have showing compassion. So when we think about problems across the world, when we think about suffering in Africa, um, it's more difficult for us to really feel that sense of compassion than when we see the suffering person next to us. Mm. So how do we create a kind of compassion that can see itself responding to all of humanity rather than just the suffering we uh, see in front of us? That's a I already mentioned we need a concept of oneness of humanity. If they are happy, if they are happy, of course, that's a guarantee of my own happiness. If people unhappy, uh, difficult to uh, trust each other, difficult to trust where? That kind of distrust, suspicious sort of society. How can you be a happy person? Impossible. See your neighbor, you see, when you, you yourself and also the society uh, too much sort of competitive sort of feeling. Competition, there are also, you see, the variety, I think different kind of competition, sense of competition. If we sort of precise more mental level, emotional level, there are differences. There are many different kinds of sort of competition. But generally, uh, uh, sort of too much, too much sort of competition, sense of competition. That easily, you see, develop jealousy. Jealousy develop distrust. So then, uh, your neighbor, look this neighbor, uh, you feel some suspicion, distrust. Look here, also distrust. Look here, also. And then, how can that family be happy? Happy sort of, sort of, sort of the society, sort of happy family. family. Because of the very basis where you live, full of distrust. How can? So these things, I think use common sense like that. So these, uh, through systematic education, I think we can change such sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm stressing the importance of education uh, about the secular ethics. Uh, we already sort of discussed with my uh, uh, the so science so the scientist, friend of scientist. You see, they, we already working some kind of, because of the draft yeah, yeah. curriculum. curriculum. Oh. Uh, strictly based on secular. So 
that curriculum can be can include in secular education field. So, so there are a lot of sort of uh, lot of this one way academic subject about mind about emotion. What is the contradictory sort of situation among different emotions? Firstly, educate these things. Then, uh, gradually, you see, tell some emotions are very bad for our health. Uh, not only peace of mind, but also very bad for our health. And the society problem, a lot of problems. The senseless sort of killing. Uh, and also the problem of the drug. If someone who really peaceful mind, then no need drug. You see, mentally unhappy, so then this lack of, sort of knowledge how to reduce sort of mental problem, then just relying on alcohol or cosine drugs yes. like that. America, I think, as of the Seems as a lot of customers, a lot of customers, customers, right? customers of drugs. <laughs> so then blame on some other country. Oh, you produce that. You produce. firstly, uh, not not customer there. Then they will not bring. <laughs> so, so if so, you see the. Uh, I think half uh, academic subject. Then uh, make so what's the day, because of that, make clear to the student through their own experiences. Then how to tackle these sort of destructive emotion. Since knows the whole map of emotion, then much easier to tackle these things. So the secular uh, teaching of secular ethics, not just to say uh, compassion, compassion, important of compassion, compassion, not that way. Uh, very details or explanation. First, I usually call map of the emotion. Then show uh, through this way you can achieve peace of mind. Once uh, peace of mind also, you see, uh, not in the sense without any problem quite relaxed. No. Full of problem, but mind can remain relaxed. So we have the ability to achieve that. So through training, through mindfulness. In order to carry mindfulness, you need more detailed information. How to so how to how to work. How how it works. How the mind works. Like that. So, I'm an ethicist. I spend a lot of my career. I spend a lot of my career teaching physicians medical ethics. And you have situations where you have, for example, a damaged baby, a baby born damaged and in great suffering. And compassion on one side says, let the child die, and compassion on another side on the other side says give this child a chance for life. How does secular ethics help us make complex, difficult decisions where compassion might argue for both sides of a difficult ethical problem? So then you really have to judge by case by case by looking at the all the implications. I think compassion, sense of concern of others' well-being, mainly biological factor, then sometimes difficult to judge. But trained sense of, sense of concern of others' well-being, 
very much combined with wisdom or intelligence. So the, the compassion side is a sense of concern and develop willpower, enthusiasm. But then how to handle that complicated situation? Then wisdom side, intelligence, judge more, look more holistic way, never tear the unity something. So, so then it really requires a lot of complex thought processes taking into account, you know, the, the pros and cons, and as well as long-term and short-term consequences and implications. Now, for example, abortion. Generally, it is an act of killing. Uh, should not do. But one particular case, uh, the circumstances are such, uh, if you see uh, the, as a, a child the fetus, no. born uh, handi uh, uh, handicapped, uh, handicapped, hundred percent sure, no future. And then the family also uh, face a lot of difficulties. That such sort of uh, particular circumstances, particular case, particular circumstances, then abortion should be permissible. So like that, you say think, holistic way, and then pros and cons like that. Yes. Yeah, so in in beyond religion, you talk about the, the necessity to start with compassion, but then add what you call discernment, rational thought, thinking a problem through. I think that's where Western philosophy has created wonderful systems of thinking things through. So the discernment side seems to be well-developed in Western ethics, and the compassion side seems to be well-developed in Eastern ways of thought. So has the time come for us to bring these two together and to create an ethics that brings the best of the Western and the best of the Eastern together? Is that what secular ethics is? I don't know. I don't know. Firstly, is it too much sort of Kasoda, emphasis division east and west? Uh, I don't think it's right. East and all the human being, same emotion. Uh, West and also same human being, uh, same emotion. Uh, then I think, uh, like uh, usually as we call the uh, those religion like Judo Christian or uh, culture, is very much related with uh, these two sort of faiths, and then also is Islam. Well, all these sort of religions. They really emphasize the practice of love. So, the, the one indication, one sign of the, they consider importance of practice of love, you see, they also, you see, teach, also carry teaching of forgiveness, tolerance. Why? Different uh, practice of love. Oh, protect. Oh, protect us of love. Practice of love. Then also, you see, too much greed. Also, sometimes it's a great problem. So, teaching of contentment. And finally, you see, the, we, by, by biological effect or something, certain negative things also is impossible to come. Therefore, self and discipline. All these teachings, all these practices, meant for practice of love. So very sort of philosophical view also, you see, they supporting you see, these practices. I feel the, the faith use the, the method to practice love and compassion in order to create single sort of pointed faith the concept of creator also come. 
So all these philosophical views are, or say, the method to, the way of approach to increase, uh, to promote practice of love and compassion. That, uh, that's my view. Therefore, the, uh, the, the previous pope who retired, I usually call German pope, uh, he also, you see, emphasis, faith and reason must go together. So, I think all major religious tradition, you see, use the, some kind of reasons. Uh, uh, I think it's sometimes the people simply, you see, the emphasis faith. But the real purpose of faith is practice of love. This all same. So, uh, Eastern philosophy, Eastern sort of, of spirituality, <laughs> mainly ancient Indian sort of the, uh, traditions, uh, traditions uh, where the practice of single pointed mind and also what's called insight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Insight. So, these are uh, some kind of work of the mind. Therefore, more explanation about mind, about emotion. And particularly in the Buddhism, there's a lot of explanation about mind, about these things. Now, these are human treasure. We cannot say this belongs to East, uh, this belongs to West. I don't think. Like I think Western technology, uh, you see, the Easterner, you see, we never say this is from, this is Western thing. Some individual, maybe some orthodox, may say this has come from West, is something. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you see, the uh, entire sort of Eastern, sort of Russian, right, yeah. copy from the uh, West. Because that, is, that, that shows the oneness of humanity. Now, Western also. Now, I think uh, last, I think, few centuries, two to three centuries, is a science and technology, uh, this is a develop. So, a lot of sort of material development techno with help of technology. So, you see, people, so I think all your sort of mental energy and physical energy concentrate on, on this field. Then, later part of the 20th century, uh, uh, many scientists and many sort of as a medical scientists and also some the different field scientists, different field of science. science. Now begin to pay more attention about inner world, about mind, about emotion. So you should not consider some these sort of uh, as of the knowledge about mind or these things something exclusively Eastern. Uh, no, I don't think. I th I really feel this. we are same. I think, I think one most important part is Easterner can marry Westerner very happily. <laughs> uh, so that shows we are one, same, <laughs> same human being. <laughs> Except we, I think color of hair, and the color of skin, sometimes it's a mixture. That doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. One of the places um, where we see conflict today uh, throughout the world is in the relationship between nations. And while we can embrace an ethic of love and compassion um, in our education of our children, our relations one to another, it seems somehow that it's much harder to do that in politics, especially in geopolitics, in politics across the world. With all the conflicts that are going on now where there seems to be very little compassion involved, how do we foster a sense of compassion on a global scale? How do we get nations to think of each other with compassion? How do we create a politics of compassion? The nations are global level. Huh? Geo no. Here, I think one good example I always mentioned 
the spirit of European Union. Uh, like France and Germany, through centuries killing each other. Truly, uh, one my sort of, uh, I consider not only my friend, but also I consider my tutor about quantum physics. Uh, one German, uh, von Weizsäcker, professor, great sort of scientist. Uh, he once told me, when he was young, every German eye, French is their enemy. Similarly, in the French eye, Germany is their enemy. Uh, now that kind of concept completely changed, he told me. Mm -hmm. So the reality, uh, in spite of, sort of what's the, too much sort of violence, historically, uh, but Adana and De Gaulle, they uh, create sort of the, the European Union. They found now no longer importance of individual nations, mm -hmm. but think about common interest. These are not necessarily come from religious teaching, but simply use, co simply use common sense and based on common sense, common experiences. So like that. So, uh, one time, one Indian sort of, <laughs> I think they uh, building, create Indian Union. Also, you see, the South Indian, East Indian, West Indian, North Indian, different language, different script. But under one union, they all live together. So I think the very concept, the create creation of union of Soviet, Soviet socialist. Uh, I think the original idea is wonderful, but then system is it too much based on <laughs> control, and that system, that system, that system of that country, uh, when they start Bolshevik revolution. Is it too much sort of violence? Uh, uh, it is quite logical. There is a lot of violence, a lot of war, civil war, and the suspicion and control is part of the method. So unfortunately, that method then become part of their system. That's the unfortunate. Otherwise, the original sort of idea is, I think, very good. Think, common interest and build some kind of union. So we human beings, I think, have that kind of sort of, sort of capacity. Uh, capacity. Now South Af now, now Africa, some sort of concept of pan-African. These are, you see, the people, some people, at least some people, you see, realize common interest is more important than individual nations' interest. Although some now European unions, the euro, some kind of problems, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. there, there seem to be many leaders that are examples of that for us uh, here in the United States, people like Martin Luther King, but Gandhi and Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right. uh, Vaclav Havel, we seem to have occasionally these leaders that's, that have compassion as part of the way in which yes. they try to, to rule. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Late President Havel, oh, wonderful person. Mm -hmm. Recently I was in Czech because I really admire him. So I, uh, I find, I, I, I try to found one op time. time and I visited his uh, office and when I reached there, his sort of old chair, usually he sit, and of course empty. Uh, there's nothing can be done. I just touch my head mm -hmm. for his chair. And I told uh, the gathering uh, a people, <coughs> he no longer with us. Then we uh, admire those people who admire him, 
who have admiration about him, uh, we have the responsibility to carry his spirit, his wish, his vision. So like that. And then, as you mentioned, the uh, reconciliation uh, movement in South Africa, mainly, I think, under the leadership of Bishop Tutu. I think wonderful. I think this kind of work is really very, very relevant. But all this is a problem. I consider, you see, they, uh, these are symptom of the past so negligence. So once this is symptom really you see, all the this will happen, then very difficult to deal. We're learning now that even very young children have a sense of fairness, have a sense of morality. Mm -hmm. They do experiments now with three months old, six months old, and show that they have that. Not only human being, but even animals. Right. Yes. Dogs, cats. Mm -hmm. oh, they also have this ability. Yes. Oh. See, too, Kasa. Uh, if you treat them sincerely, they respond very sincerely. If we treat them, give some food, not very sincerity, then they also respond not very sincerely. <laughs> yes. So these are uh, most of the mammals, except you see some mammals, you see, they grown up without any sort of care by mother. Maybe some different. Otherwise, you see, the all mammals you see, have the same sort of, sort of the emotions, like that. Then I uh, often, you see, I sort of express one of my curiosities. Still, now I'm expecting see, some biological scientist. <laughs> I'm waiting, I think last now, I think at least 20, I think 15, 20 years, I just waited. Uh, the brain, very tiny, like dogs, cats, if you show affection, they appreciate that, so response accordingly. So very small, tiny sort of insect, uh, uh, like mosquito. <laughs> so uh, when, when my mood, good. And then also, you see, they uh, almost show no malaria carry. <laughs> then sometimes I give some blood to, uh, to mosquito. mosquito. Mm. <laughs> then I watch. Uh, then uh, the mosquito sucks my blood and his, his or her, I don't know. Uh, whole, whole, whole body, you see, become red. Then fly. There is no sign of appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> so those who are scientists, or especially brain scientists, <laughs> I think I'm waiting, you see, one day they may say the size of brain such such, then the ability show appreciation. Uh, smaller than that, then no ability to show concern, appreciation. <laughs> I'm just, still, I'm wanting answer. <laughs> um, so pe people, people who bought tickets here had an opportunity to ask some questions as they bought tickets on the website that allowed. And I have some of those questions here, oh, yeah. so I'm going to ask some of the questions that were um, yeah. asked by our audience. What do you think of political acts of extremism performed by Buddhists, Buddhists such as self-immolation? The Buddhists who set themselves on fire to protest politically. Oh, these are very, very complicated. Actually, again, it's a symptom of certain causes. Uh, so since, you see, this uh, unfortunate, sad things you see, happen, I simply, firstly, you see, uh, these are very, very sensitive political issue. The Chinese government always blame all these, uh, something happened in negative, 
inside the bed, they immediately see uh, blame on us. Uh, so whatever we, we say, you see, they always blame. So therefore, firstly, this is a sensitive political issue. And then secondly, I always, now I already, now these are the symptoms of some political repression. So I already retired uh, now since 2011. Now I completely retired from political responsibility. So, <laughs> however, when this first sort of uh, incident has happened, I express, uh, I doubt how much effect that. Uh, so while I sort of express my sort of sadness, it means sort of sad. <laughs> but then most important, I have nothing to offer them. So, very difficult. Uh, so then, you see, the violence or non, not violence is depend, entirely depend on their motivation. In the case, uh, such sort of act carried with full hatred, anger, then negative. Uh, I think one, one occasion, one monk, you see, uh, he carries some sort of special sort of Oh, uh, preparations, Chimbi. Uh, preparations, Chimbi. Offerings. Offerings. Uh, uh, and also, you see, there are, what will he, he wrote a testament. Oh, uh, very much religious sort of minded. So, in such case, uh, I don't think, you see, the, we can call violence. Difficult to say. So, ultimately, it depends on the motivation. Like that. Hmm. Hmm. Another question. Some people wonder about the nature of compassion uh, when it's well known that when you help another person, you yourself feel good. Uh, so, does all ethics and morality, does all, do all good acts ultimately come from selfishness? Or is there true altruism in the world? Is there true sacrifice for others when we get a reward mm -hmm. for doing it and how we feel? I usually call, uh, by nature, every sentient being, particularly human being, really loves oneself. But then, helping others, as I mentioned earlier, actually helping your own happy future, build your own happy future. So, uh, I usually call that we are selfish. It's right, it's good, but it should be uh, wise selfish rather than foolish selfish. <laughs> uh, I think, I think as, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, taking drugs, they also say love, the, love themselves. But that is just a foolish selfish they, for something temporary sort of peace of mind. And then you should take these drugs, these things. So that's not wise selfish. Uh, and a lot of, sort of physical exercise and hardship is comparatively more wise selfish. <laughs> and similarly, you see showing a uh, sense of compassion sense of concern of others' well-being. Uh, actually, that's create, cre uh, the right method of creation of more friends, more smiles. Uh, if you remain with a bad sort of face, an ugly face like that, then you will not get any friend <laughs> like that. So, we need friendship. <laughs> we are social animals. We need cooperation. Cooperation entirely based on trust, friendship. Uh, trust entirely based on a uh, sense of concern of their well-being. Then trust comes. Some people uh, may feel if you are rich, then you get more friend. I think these friends are actually not friend of, uh, person. Uh, friend of person, but friend of money. A friend of power. So once your power uh, 
decline, your money also you see decline, then these friends I think may not respond. If you, even you want to te 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 call. telephone call, you may not get answer. Uh, <laughs> so these are not a friend of person, but friend of money or power. So these are not a genuine friend. The genuine friendship only come if you, you show genuine of sense of concern on the basis of oneness of humanity, human brothers, sisters. That we can do. The reality also telling that if something happened in very far away, it affects uh, your side also. Felt. Oh, so that's the uh, that's today's reality. Yes. A woman writes in, she has two children, 11 uh, and 12 years old. She wants to know what experiences you had as a child that led you to a life of love and compassion and how can she help her children lead that kind of life? I always telling people, uh, I have some kind of sort of a certain amount of of because of that so amount of com compassion. compassion. That firstly, I learned from my mother. My mother, illiterate, uneducated, of course, uh, uh, generally is a quite sort of ordinary, poor, villagers, farmers, but a very warm-hearted person. So almost. Hmm, I think her children, I think no one knows or no one sort of saw my mother's angry face. Always very, very kaza, gentle. Very gentle. So my mother's sort of gentleness, uh, I think sometimes I telling people, spoils me as a, at, that, at that time, I'm youngest sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, right. of child. So, as a villager, at that time, you see, of course, no toys, nothing. Uh, my mother used to carry me, and even you see, when mother used to working in, in the field, mother used to carry me. So then, I use I used the mother like sort of the, my cousin, like Shamba, or like, like horse. And then <laughs> you see, hold my mother's two ears. Hmm? <laughs> when I want to go this side, <laughs> want to go this side, I do. If mother not listen, then shout. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother, so kind. So, they, so therefore, uh, uh, I always is telling people the human history, I think, uh, say, you see, the, uh, uh, 100,000 years ago, or like that, in the ancient time, you see, small population, no concept of leadership. We all, the Marxists say, the original communism. Uh, and then, so all, everybody worked together, and whatever they get, they got, uh, share together. And then, gradually, farming system increased, and population also increased. Then some mischievous people, stealing or bully, these things happened. So the concept of leadership come. So at that time, no rule of education, no education. Therefore, uh, the main quality in order to become leadership is physical strength. That is the way male dominance, you see, come. And then eventually education develops. Education brings more equal, men, uh, male and female. Uh, now, today, the general sort of education not, not adequate. We need education about warm-heartedness. Mm. In that field, females have 
special role to promote human affection, human compassion. Therefore, female should take more active role promotion of human affection, human compassion. Some scientists, you see, they experimented some sort of pictures, uh, painful sort of uh, experience. Uh, painful experience, picture of someone you see, passing through you see, very difficult, painful experiences. Then one male, one female watching. On the physical level, the female much more sensitive about others' pain. So the physical reaction is much stronger. Uh, the female is stronger. Females are more stronger than the male. So therefore, uh, biologically, also you see, female is more sensitive, more potential, affection. So I often say, telling uh, one story. One day, my flight from, I think, from Tokyo to uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco. Uh, see, there I noticed is one couple, uh, quite young, father and mother, and two children. So they, uh, and then uh, in the in the early early period, at the when, at the, at the beginning, it's both parent is a look after these two children. One sort of a little bit elder one, you see, they're running here and there. And then you see, the, uh, one of the parents, you see, always follow like that. Then, after a few hours, uh, next morning, uh, father no longer active, <laughs> sleep. <laughs> Mother still, you see, look after, you see, that, that boy. That, uh, then I noticed the mother's eye become very red. So the enthusiasm. Of course, uh, we cannot generalize. Uh, but in that case, you see, I saw the mother's affection is more stronger than the father. <laughs> 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 of course, we cannot generalize these things. <laughs> So that's, I think, then birds, many birds, and also mammals. You see, uh, a father, some cases, you see, uh, simply you see, enjoy, then nothing. <laughs> uh, but some birds, you see, the whole sort of, at, at least several years, you see, together. Uh, then you see, feeding these things, mother, Really, you see, carry much, much sort of respect. Acting uh, role. Uh, uh, acting role. Oh, acting role. So, no religion, mm -hmm. no constitution, simply biological factor. So, like that. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us, Your so, Holiness. So, those uh, people generally. Of course, I hope, I wish, you see, the people who come uh, here, you see, please think, these are the points which I mentioned, think more by yourself, analyze, and then also discuss with your friends. Then if you feel there's some uh, sort of the, some meaning, uh, then implement and then share it to more people. Then those individuals who have not much interest, then outside this hall, uh, don't bother, <laughs> forget, <laughs> forget. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good, good, good. Oh, yes. Paul, thank you very, very much for facilitating that conversation. Holiness. Mm.
Holiness, you had said, I believe, at the outset that you were concerned that you would be a worthless professor. Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've proven that you're a very worthy <laughs> professor, and we thank you for your comments. Then and, please and increase for salary. <laughs> well, maybe not that <laughs> 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 too many witnesses. I have too many <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will return with a formal program at 1 o'clock, but, but I w uh, you will enjoy being in your seats at about 12.30. You will have a chance to hear from Richard Moore and hear more about his story in advance of our 1 o'clock program. So be in your seats at 12.30. Uh, this Richard, of course, is, is the gentleman that His Holiness refers to as his hero. So we look forward to uh, seeing you this afternoon, and I ask uh, one more vote of thanks, uh, expression of thanks for His Holiness and for Paul Wolpe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. My boss. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.